I'm Ryan, this is my brother Daniel, and this is Roles in the Family. Today, we are reviewing Terraforming Mars, a strategic engine-building game about completing projects that will transform the surface of Mars to become habitable for human life. And if you enjoy games with tons of unique cars that present an ever-changing puzzle on how to prioritize and build your engine most efficiently, Terraforming Mars is one of our top recommendations. And just like every video, we've got a link to Terraforming Mars down below if you want to check it for, out for yourself after watching this video. But Ryan, let's hop in this ship. It's time for Blast Off. Let's jump let's into the review. In Terraforming Mars, you are a giant corporation in the 2400s that is contributing to a worldwide effort to make Mars habitable by raising its temperature, oxygen level, and ocean coverage. You will scale your production to allow you to take on more and more projects that not only further this mission, but establish yourself as the most impactful corporation in this new scientific era. Each generation, you will have the opportunity to pay to acquire new project cards and then put your resources to work as you pay for projects and reap benefits that range from increased production for yourself to direct impact to the vital metrics for life on Mars. Various projects will also allow you to establish cities, greeneries, oceans, and other tiles on the surface of Mars as players compete over the most lucrative positioning on the planet. Once all players have finished their actions in a generation, your production engine will generate more resources, you'll research new project cards to add to your hand, and a new generation will begin. Generations continue until the temperature, oxygen, and ocean coverage have all met the minimum requirements for life on Mars. Terraforming Mars is all about building an engine that will give you the power to make the most impact over the course of the game. Projects that provide resource production are very attractive in the early game as you work to scale up your efforts. However, impacting the requirements for habitation is also profitable as it raises your terraforming rating, which not only determines the winner at the end of the game, but also increases your money production, which is the primary resource for playing project cards. You will also want to keep a close eye on the milestones and awards as they provide big opportunities for endgame points but are in direct competition with the other players. Milestones are a race to a certain condition, such as having three cities or eight building tags on cards, and only three of the five milestones can be claimed. Awards are player-funded endgame scoring conditions, where the first and second highest performing players will gain points at the end of the game. Funding an award allows you to ensure the scoring is aligned with your strengths, and while doing it earlier is cheaper, it also gives your opponents more information on what to pursue during the game. With so many project cards and standard actions available, the game is filled with tough trade-offs. This is especially evident during the research phase when you have the opportunity to acquire new cards. For each card you decide to keep, you must pay three credits, decreasing your funds that are available to actually play the project cards later. Many of the cards also have specific requirements, such as the oxygen having reached a certain level, which makes it tough to decide if it is worth holding on to a card, even though it may not be playable for several generations. And given that the game length is largely dictated by the player's collective progress on the three metrics of habitability, there's an element of knowing when to push the pace more when you think you are ahead and keeping an eye on how each metric is progressing as it impacts which cards are playable and puts an expiration date on some benefits. For example, you may have some huge asteroid event card that would raise the temperature by three levels, which equates to three points on the terraform rating track. However, if the temperature is already maxed out, this card is way less attractive as you lose out on all the temperature raising benefit. It is important that you balance the development of your own engine with the unique dynamics of your opponent's actions. We feel that three to four players is the sweet spot for terraforming Mars. Five players starts to introduce a lot of downtime and you don't get to do as much since there are now five players contributing to the same habitable requirements. Two players can suffer from the opposite problem where the game can really drag if players are pursuing strategies that aren't pushing those metrics forward, and it makes the interactive parts of the game less interesting. And while I haven't been drawn back to the solo mode after using it once to learn the game, it is worth a look if you're interested in solo play. 
One of the strengths of Terraforming Mars is how the compelling theme drives a lot of the mechanisms and flavor in the game. Cards have effects and prerequisites that make sense, and it is cool to see the surface of Mars transform over the course of the game. The efficiency puzzle of Terraforming Mars is one that greatly favors skill, with the caveat that there is a ton of randomness in the cards you draw throughout the game. We enjoy playing with the drafting variant that reduces this luck factor with some added playtime, but especially with the standard rules, the luck of the draw can drastically benefit some players over others. While a lot of your strategy is focusing on your own production engine, there are also a lot of areas where you are affected by other players, such as competition for spaces on the surface of Mars, racing for milestones, timing of funding awards, and how player strategies will affect the pace of the core habitable metrics. Besides the steady flow of cards, the actions of other players require you to remain tactical and ready to react. Setting up the game is reasonable for a game of this complexity. It's mostly getting the various supply piles set up, shuffling all of the cards, and dealing each player their initial options. There is a lot going on here for a new player, but it is somewhat alleviated by the simplicity of all project cards requiring credits. It is logical that producing more money will let you play more cards, but it can be difficult for new players to grasp a lot of the tangential considerations such as when to use standard projects, how to pursue milestones and awards effectively, the trade-offs between buying or passing on cards in the research phase, etc. The variability in Terraforming Mars is huge, primarily driven by the giant deck of unique cards. The beginning of the game has each player picking from two corporations and paying to keep projects from a selection of 10 cards. And if players happen to be itching for more variety, expansions like Prelude, which adds additional randomized start game options, and Hellas and Elysium, which adds two more unique maps, will be sure to satisfy. So much of what you do in Terraforming Mars is about increasing your production each round. As the game progresses, it is exciting to have more and more resources at your disposal to strategically deploy to keep the snowball rolling. And besides raw production, playing blue active cards will give you ongoing abilities or once-per-generation actions that can be foundational to your strategic direction. And part of the reason building that engine is so fun is because there is such variety in the project cards that your production can be used for. With a steady flow of four new cards you could acquire each research phase, every game plays out differently and the strategy remains fluid as you process new opportunities. This also leads to great diversity in strategies. One game you might be hammering the surface of Mars with cities and greeneries, but another game you might have some crazy microbe engine that is mostly about generating points on your own cards. That core decision in the research phase, do I pay three credits to keep this card or not, is always grueling because you are spending the same resource that you ultimately need to play the project cards. Sometimes you need to pass on a card you love simply because it is more important that you keep the three credits to ensure you can complete certain actions this round. The decision is made even more interesting as you weigh the value of production cards based on how many generations you think are left in the game as well as strong cards that have prerequisites, such as 10% oxygen, that won't be playable for a while. And if the steady flow of cards was not enough to keep you on your strategic toes, the actions of other players can be very impactful as well. In the early game, you want to be very aware of milestones, as each can only be claimed by one player, and only three milestones can be claimed in total. But there are other times that an opportunity presents itself that you weren't considering. For example, a player builds a second greenery that leaves an empty space with two adjacent greeneries. Cities score for every adjacent greenery at the end of the game, so maybe it is worth completely pivoting to grab that attractive spot before someone else can build a city there. The game strikes a great balance between the satisfaction of working on your own thing while still interacting meaningfully with other players. That said, not all of the interaction feels great. Specifically, there are a number of cards, often asteroids or some other kind of catastrophic event, that allow you to destroy plants of another player. The impact can range from insignificant to quite brutal, but it is even more the fact that 95% of the game doesn't have that kind of negative interaction that makes it feel out of place. While it can be a mechanism for targeting the leader to even the playing field, 
oftentimes it boils down to which player just happens to have the resource that is being targeted. In our experience, both the attacking player and the targeted player end up feeling bad. While we can see some of the design justification for these attacks, both mechanically and thematically, we can't help feeling the game might just be more fun without them. The giant deck of unique cards in Terraforming Mars is a double-edged sword. It is what powers the variability and dynamic strategic decisions that we have praised, but the side effect is that players can find themselves at the mercy of randomness. You might have great titanium production and never draw space cards that let you utilize it. You might be close to the building tag milestone only to not draw a building tag for several generations. You could draw cards that are literally unplayable because their minimum environmental thresholds have already been passed. It is inevitable with this kind of card variety, but that doesn't change the fact that it doesn't feel awesome when that randomness clearly impacts the outcome of the game. And now let's get to our personal ratings for Terraforming Mars. Well, Terraforming Mars, I think for both Ryan and I, is in the upper echelon of games. We just love talking about echelons, especially the upper ones. What even is an echelon? That's a I don't know. You don't, you don't ever hear people saying like the lower echelons, right? Or, yeah, or, maybe... just an, or just an echelon on its own. <laughs> yeah, Anyways. Just... <laughs> <laughs> vocab word for the week <laughs> uh but but terrifying marsh truly is in that top tier for me of when i think of just games that deliver some of my favorite all-time uh experiences this is right up there with it and that's why i'm going to be coming in with a 9.5 for terraforming mars um it just delivers every time for me like i very rarely have a game of terraforming Mars that like I might play bad, but in terms of yeah. the game delivering, it is so consistent on just delivering a wonderful experience. And I think the thing that maybe separates terraforming Mars from just other, you know, there's so me and you, we both love so many of these kind of this, this is like our prime window of games, like these like heavy kind of, you know, heavier strategic to like, two this is to where our top hours. games typically are found. And I think what's fun about this one is it has this like beautiful balance between such an addicting personal engine building of, mm-hmm. your, you know, you've got this, you're just, you're building this engine. You feel it as it's just growing and growing and, and that's a ton of fun. But then it also has the interaction on the shared player board and navigating like those two things kind of together, I find is really interesting um, in this game and sometimes even challenging. Like, you know, oftentimes when I'm teaching this game, I specifically say to new players, like, don't forget about the, you know, milestone, like pick a milestone and just go for it. Because, uh, you know, if you miss out on all of those, you still could win. But it's going to yeah, be challenging. You made it harder and, on yourself. And, and, and likewise, you know, with the, the shared player board, especially if someone's going like a greenery route, you really need to be, you just need to be at least be aware of like, where can you, where can you capitalize? Oh, someone just, they, they have two greeneries by each other. Oh, I could drop a city right there yeah. and whatnot. Um, and so I just find the interplay between that like personal engine building and the shared player board kind of I don't know blends really well um yeah and most of the interaction is like positive interaction or at least not like really negative interaction Mm -hmm. you know you're kind of getting each other's way and changing things but you know when you're playing a game that's so much building your own thing sometimes it can feel really and we actually talked about as a negative here is there are a few cards that are a little bit more pointed attacks yeah um and you know it just can be hard if you're not prepared for that to go from I'm building my own thing to oh there go my plants. Yeah, and actually and and really and this is honestly probably like my one negative of the game is is that yeah. those do just feel out of place. And and specifically just those moments where like someone plays one and they like the leader, like it's one thing to like go after the leader and it's yeah. like okay, you know, everyone even the leader is like okay, I'm I'm in Poor first place. Over Daniels so. there finally got up to <laughs> six plants. <laughs> so yeah, I'm in like last place over here and I finally get enough to get a greenery and I'm the only one with plants. It's like yeah. I'm so sorry Daniel. You know, yeah. that's not fun and just like we mentioned just feels kind of a little bit out of this out of the spirit of the game um 
But that aside, it is so much fun. I mean, I think both of us really love the mechanic of in, in any game where you're get draw, you're getting cards and, you know, card drafting, but deciding kind of which ones to keep and which ones to, you know, get rid of to mm-hmm. essentially have more money. You know, it's almost a little bit kind of like what we love about Race for the Galaxy, right? Yeah. It's the what to keep, what to use for resources. And this game, that tension is so hard because yeah. you, you're getting every round, you're getting these cards and you're like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. Oh my gosh, but that's so good. And you're so, but you can't keep it all. And, and that, yeah, if you keep all decisions. four, that's 12 credits out the door. And like very rarely is that like worth it to do yeah. all four because you're really strapping, you know, what you're going to be able to play that round. Yeah, and we've obviously found that the card drafting is has really helped with balancing out just the like, oh, that person just got dealt really yeah. lucky and I didn't. Um, it makes the so, research phase even more grueling, though, because now you're starting to consider, oh, I can't pass this to him. Like, yeah. like they've got all these Jovian, Jovian things yeah. and I've got a Jovian scoring one or like you just see that it's really good for them. And so now you're like, do I keep this one that's so we we do really enjoy playing with mm. the drafting. It's one that, you know, you probably only want to be playing with more experienced players and it is adding a little bit of time. Mm-hmm. But I mean, it has become our preferred way. Oh, of for play. sure. For yeah. sure. Yeah. And I'd say the other really interesting thing about this game is the pacing of it, because you have those three kind of things that all need to happen to end the game in terms of temperature hitting a rating uh, all the ocean tiles going out and the oxygen hitting you know the the max level and what's interesting is every game those like the pace of that can be different and that changes how you play so like yeah. if someone early in the game you know maybe play some asteroids and stuff and the temperature just flies up well now suddenly one cards that you play you can play cards maybe earlier that needed a certain temperature, but then it's also challenging because if for half the game temperature's already been maxed, well, now you don't really have that much incentive to be, you know, building up a lot of heat. In fact, heat can, you can get a situation where you have all this heat and you're like, I have nothing I can do with this. And so, but then instead of, you know, if it was oxygen, that, that changes things. And so I find that's really interesting is you're trying to kind of read the, the pacing of the game and then fit your strategy kind of around that, you know, as you're, as you're, uh, yeah. And if you're being, you know, it. very strategic about like paying attention to what other players are doing, you know, if I see you over there, man, Daniel's got an amazing heat engine. Like you're just producing heat. I might want to at least be doing Rush some stuff on temperature because yeah. if I let it just slow play, you're going to just power all, all of it. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, that adaptability, I, I, yeah, I think is really interesting um, without yeah. being like a negative, like that doesn't feel that negative, like I'm no. directly hurting you, but it is definitely affecting how I'm approaching things. Yeah. So I'd say the game actually does have a decent amount of you needing to be aware of what your opponents are doing. There's a lot of, of you, you got to be okay. You know, that, that's kind of the, sometimes the hard thing is you're so focused on this personal engine. You need to be looking at what other people are doing for milestones, for awards. If someone's playing tons of greeneries, you got, you can't just let them, you know, yeah. go rampant with Optimize that. You got to, you got to just, you know, throw in some cities, you know, and then card drafting, you're looking at, you know, if you're doing that variant, you're looking at what that, there's a lot of kind of managing what are other people doing. Yeah. And, I enjoy that, but, but if, you know, if yeah. someone doesn't, doesn't enjoy that interaction, you know, that can, that can be a downside, but yeah. So there's, I mean, gosh, terraforming Mars is again, one of those, we have quite a few expansions for it. I mean, I think both of us would say prelude is like just an absolute must. Yeah. Buy I was going like. to mention that, that yeah. like, you know, our ratings have definitely settled on, like we typically use drafting. We love using prelude. We'll sometimes mm-hmm. use colonies, which we find enjoy to be colonies. one that we enjoy. Yep. Um, so that all plays into our personal ratings. Um, yeah. That said, like Spe- if I had the opportunity to throw down on base game, Terraform Mars, I'd be a happy, happy man. Happy camper. But Prelude, Speaking of personal ratings, if you Ryan. like, yeah, yeah. If you like Terraform Mars, though, it Prelude becomes like almost a oh, no-brainer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Prelude, yeah, personal now we're waiting rating. on Prelude, too. We're waiting on Prelude, too. Yep. So I waffled on this one. I waffled. went back and forth. That's yes. What mean. You know, look it up. So <laughs> I was very close to giving this a 10. 
but I also oh. settled at a 9.5. Okay. And it's hard for me to know if it's if it's like some of the negatives, you know, we talked about like the direct attacking and some of it, or maybe just like the highs of it that maybe don't feel like a 10, or if it's the fact that other games, other game singular that I rate a 10, <laughs> it makes feel it like there's hard a to put another in yeah. that category if there still feels like yeah. there's a gap. Yeah. But man, it's a high 9.5 for me. <laughs> it's a um, 9. It really, 9. yes. We won't get more granular than our 0.5 system. Okay. But, um, yeah, so many great experiences. One that, I mean, I think I'm up around almost 30 plays or so. Um, and that's spread over the last, what, seven, eight years or something. Yeah. And it's just yeah. been consistent. It's just like, you know, there's some games that, enter the collection and kind of become like a new staple. Like there's some games that like get pulled out every once in a while, but there's ones that fit in more of this cap- category mm-hmm. of like, this is kind of just a staple for this type of game. Like it just mm-hmm. often gets to the table when it, we're looking for that type of strategic experience. Um, and you know, I've had good games anywhere, like really from three to five players. I know five players we said kind of gets a little bit mm-hmm. long um, and, and like you don't get to do as much. Um, and it, it, oftentimes it can feel a little weird because it's like, oh my gosh, everything's going up so fast and I've hardly yeah. done anything. Um, but yeah, and you know, mix in the, we have the Hellas and Elysium board expansion. So like I'll rotate between which boards, which is actually like a pretty big difference with it completely changes the milestones and awards. Mm-hmm. Um, so as someone who loves terraforming Mars, there's a lot of fun content to explore. I don't think I recommend exploring all of it. I've never had an interest in like the, uh, what is the turmoil expansion that adds like a whole political, like, yeah. you know, and it we starts weren't, to and we feel weren't fans of bit. the, we weren't really fans of the Venus. Um, yes, I have Venus either. next and I basically leave out almost all of the Venus stuff. I keep a few of the cards. The, that, yeah. You know, it's like certain stuff. Colonies like walks the line just right for me of like it's I, I like added it. on, but it feels good. And it, you, you can integrate your strategies pretty directly. Yeah. Um, instead of like Venus, it was like, well, there's one person like doing a Venus strategy and like nobody else cares. And it yeah, just it felt yeah. a little more disconnected. Right. Um, right. But yeah, great stuff. One that I see, you know, there's oftentimes games come out that people are like, ooh, this, you know, a newer game that is similar to this that could for certain people replace it. You mm-hmm. know, I just don't see terraforming Mars getting replaced yeah. by a game for me. I know Ares expedition came out. Some people basically said they'd never play terraforming Mars again, because mm-hmm. now this Ares expedition is faster or whatever, you know, in everything I've looked into it, it's like, man, I'd be losing a lot of what I love about terraforming Mars. And I'm okay yeah. with All some right. of the extra length to get that out of it. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. Well, I was just going to, last thing I was going to say is that, you know, it's interesting. I've been, we talk, you know, you talk about the board game world, gateway games, but I almost have started thinking about like, what are the gateway games for like, you know, we, we rate Different the weight, categories, the, the, yeah. you know, the weight of games, but what are kind of the gateway games to a category? And that's kind of what I feel like this is, is oftentimes if people are looking for a game to kind of their first experience of kind of this heavier weight of games this is often the first one I'll, I'll look at because it just, it's consistent. You can have a good yeah. play. You can have, I find it's, uh, even though it's really strategic, new players can do, per, you know, decently well. Even if well. you lose by quite a bit, like you feel like you did a lot. Like, yeah, I, so yeah. I think there's a little bit of like the satisfaction of doing things. I think it also, the game strikes that nice balance of working on your own thing, but also interaction. So no matter how a person feels about whether they prefer more interaction or more working on their own, they're getting a little bit of it from this. So yeah. it's a little safer um, as a strategic experience. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's really kind of, I think it's solidified itself as kind of that um, perfect spot uh, for me where I would agree with you. It's uh, it is a lock as of right now it's a lock. in the, <laughs> in the collection and uh, one that we enjoy thoroughly. So. But would you enjoy it thoroughly? That is the question. Dear viewer, that is the question that we also want to answer for you. If you are bothered by card randomness, don't enjoy doing a lot of mental math to allocate resources, or really prefer there to be no direct attacks in games where you are building up your own thing, then Terraforming Mars might not be for you. 
But if you want an engine building game that has a steady flow of tough decisions, huge variety in card effects, and a meaningful level of player interaction, then Terraforming Mars is one of our personal favorites and one that we can definitely recommend. Hey, thanks for watching. As you can tell, Ryan and I clearly love Terraforming Mars. And if you find yourself in that same camp, uh, you can actually go check it out. We got a link down below if you want to uh, purchase it for yourself. It also supports the channel, so we always appreciate that. And we've got a couple more videos here, and we will see you in the next one.